station manager Anthony Clegg setting up the, so the rig. Anthony, uh, you want me to sit? So yeah. Go ahead. All right. So you can just um, you can just address your your answers or whatever you're gonna say. You can just address, address them to me. Okay. Um, I'm not really gonna ask anything. Um, I'm just kind of here. Okay. Um, so you can have somebody to talk to. So one of the questions was, should this, this be done with a camera focused on me? Should it be done with a camera focused on you and me? So is it better to do it have the camera focused on me so oh. people are feeling like I'm addressing them personally? Um, we were, well, we're, we, me and Anthony were thinking that it would probably look really nice um, if, if you're addressing somebody just, um, like the camera's coming in, you're not looking straight at it, Got but it. the camera will be focused on you. Okay, so yeah. I'm not really going to be in it. I'm just here so you have somebody to talk to, okay. talk to so you have a point of focus. It okay. also helps because talking directly into a lens, you, you lose a little bit of that personality when you're actually doing the interview which actually does come across on, on camera pretty well. So I, I think with this way, there's more of a, a connection and uh, the, the story's told a little bit, a little bit more, uh, there's more humanity to it. Cause you know, we know the camera's cold. <laughs> the camera tells no lies. That's yeah, true. <laughs> so I am rolling. So Steve, whenever you'd like to like, actually start telling a story. Absolutely, go ahead. Ready? Okay. I'd like to tell you the story of Aunt Kate Wright. Kate was born into slavery October 19th, 1859 in Lexington, Fayette County, Kentucky. We don't know what her surname was at birth. We don't even know if she was given a surname at birth. We do know that her mother was Eliza, who later lived in Monrovia. And we know that at some point in your young life, Kate learned how to both read and write, which was not a usual thing for African Americans of her era. The census of 1880, when Kate was 20, she appears still in Lexington working for a private family as a nurse. Later on, she went to work as a domestic servant in the family of the Reverend John S. Van Meter, who was a Presbyterian minister in Lexington. She stayed with him and appears in the census of 1890, no, the census of 1900, in Clinton, Missouri with her son, Marshall, who was born in 1889. By this time, she was known as Kate Wright. The Reverend John S. Van Meter had a wife who had health problems. They had heard of Monrovia, California, and so he resigned his pastorate, and they came here to Monrovia in 1901. He served as pastor of a local First Presbyterian Church from 1901 until 1902 with Kate and her son Marshall, a company of the Van Meter family to Monrovia, California. In 1902, he left Monrovia, returned to Missouri, but Kate and her son Marshall stayed here. The earliest record of her living in Monrovia we have is an entry in the Monrovia tax assessment roll from 1904 showing that she owned lot four in the LB and Pew subdivision, a section in the southeastern area of Monrovia. Aunt Kate had a religious conversion about 1903, and out of that religious conversion came her conviction that her role in life was to serve as a friend and nurse to the indigent and the needy in Monrovia who were suffering. They would primarily have been suffering from tuberculosis, perhaps old age. When Aunt Kate did, she went to local merchants, local uh, laborers, local organizations. She asked for love donations of lumber and labor, and with that, she was able to build small one-room cottages on her property at 528 East Cyprus. She asked for food and nursing supplies she let it be known that if somebody in Monrovia was suffering from tuberculosis, had no resources of their own, or had any family, that they could come live and she would give them the very best care she could. She had very few financial resources of her own. Her motto was, the Lord will provide. She prayed a lot, and from unexpected sources came what she needed to deal with her patients. Aunt Kate did this for about 30 years until maybe 1933. 
And at one time had as many as 23 people she was caring for in her little house and her cabins on East Cyprus. After 30 years of doing this, though, her health broke under the strain of the heavy hours of work and she had to retire from her philanthropic work. The other thing that Aunt Kate did was to ask for donations of cash around Christmas time and Thanksgiving. They would be noted in the local newspaper. They would say, Aunt Kate's fund this week totals so much. It also listed the name of the donors. That let people, that raised the level of awareness of people in Monrovia about what was going on and being done. It also allowed her to know how much money she had to work with when it came time to buy baskets of food. She did this again up until the time she had to retire from her philanthropic work. Aunt Kate suffered a stroke in 1937. She made a brief recovery and then actually died from the results of the stroke. I'd like to read what the local newspaper editor had to say about Aunt Kate. He put this in his column that always appeared on the front page of the newspaper. He said, news has just come of the passing of Aunt Kate Wright. I can well remember in the early days of Monrovia when local physicians gave free treatment and Aunt Kate free board and lodging to sufferers from tuberculosis who were unable to pay for care. I've seen a dozen or more lying in their little one-room cottages on Aunt Kate's property, mostly whites, but with an occasional Negro or Japanese and getting the very best treatment she could give them. She served all alike, regardless of color, nationality, or creed. Aunt Kate of the Negro race was a saintly character, and during the past score of years that she labored here, she had hundreds of friends among Monrovia's pioneers who realized and valued her worth. A few days ago, when we were informed of her serious illness, we found her reading her Bible and cheerful as ever. The world, to her, was a good place to live in and a grand place to do the work of her master. Many years after her death, Lorena Smith Holmes wrote, and Lorena was the daughter of Nathan F. Smith, who was a local superintendent of schools in Monrovia in the early 1900s. After the Mad Meters left Monrovia, Aunt Kate went to work in her household, their household. After he accepted a position as superintendent of schools in South Pasadena, Aunt Kate would still go to visit the family, riding the Pacific Electric red car, which ran down Huntington Drive all the way to South Pasadena, and taking with her in a basket a big portion of her famous beaten biscuits. Anyway, Lorena, remembering back to her early childhood, wrote about Aunt Kate. She filled a void. <clears throat> I mean, yes, there were doctors who were willing to provide care gratis, but there really wasn't a place locally where people who had no funds whatsoever could go and be cared for. And what she did was to rise to that need by saying, I've got a piece of property. I will ask for donations to build places where they can live with dignity and I can, give, I can treat them. Uh, the only other option at that time was probably to go into the county hospital in Los Angeles. But being here in Monrovia allowed them a measure of self-dignity and allowed them to be close to doctors that they could go to on a regular basis and allowed other people to know about their plight and to make donations of food and money to take care of them. You know, my comment about Aunt Kate was she was a one-woman Foothill Unity Center because she did a lot of what Foothill Unity does, especially with their distributions at Thanksgiving and Christmas of baskets for the needy. If ever there were a saint, it was she. Aunt Kate was another of those who, through their involvement, their compassion, and their willingness to serve others, changed the course of local history. Thank you.